Director Member Nunes. Uh, the, the call transcript as, as published on September 25th is complete and accurate. Will both of you attest to that, Ms. Williams? I didn't take a word for word um, of course. accounting. When I first saw the, the publicly released version, it looked substantively correct to me. And Colonel Vindman? I, I think uh, I certainly would describe it as uh, substantively correct. I think or, in your testimony, your deposition, you said very accurate? Correct. Okay. And you flagged a couple edits, uh, Colonel Vindman. I, I think you had Burisma on page, um, on page four, yeah. uh, where President Zelensky was, was talking about the company mentioned in the issue. I'm sorry, could you say that question? I believe in your testimony you explained that you, you offered an edit that on page four of the transcript that was ultimately published, you, you thought President Zelensky mentioned the word Burisma. Oh, I had it in my notes. I, I know that's what he said, yes. Okay. And, and Ms. Williams, and that was on page four, correct? Correct, correct. Um, and Ms. Williams, I believe after your deposition you went back and checked your notes and you, you had um, President Zelensky using the term Burisma as well. Um, is that correct? That's correct. Um, but, but that came up on a different part of the transcript than what Colonel Vindman was relating to, correct? Yes, I believe so. Um, I yours came up on page five, and it would have been in substitution for the word case? That's right. That's where I have it in my notes. Okay. Um, Colonel Vindman, we, we've had some discussion uh, earlier today and also at your deposition about whether the president had a demand for President Zelensky. Um, and, you know, I suggested to you in the deposition that the president words are in fact ambiguous and, and he uses he uses some phrases that um, certainly could be uh, characterized uh, as hedging on page three in, in the first paragraph he talks about whatever you can do he talks about if that's possible uh, on page four um, he, he mentions if you could speak to him um, he's talking about the attorney general um, or Rudy Giuliani and then at the end of the first paragraph on page four, he says, whatever you can do. The president also says, you know, if you can look into it. And, and, and I asked you during your deposition whether you saw or acknowledged the fact that certain people could read that to be ambiguous. And I said, correct, yes. And I believe you said, I, I think people want to hear what they have already preconceived. Is that what you testified? Actually, if I could ask for just a page site. 256. 256. Yeah. And a line. Thank you. Just a minute, please. And. Just a minute. Okay. Okay. We got the page. Okay. And, and then you went on to say, yeah, you, you agreed with me. You said, yeah, I guess you could interpret it different ways. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, t turning attention to the, the, the preparation of the transcript, uh, that followed in the, the ordinary process, correct? I, so I think uh, it followed the appropriate process in terms of making sure that uh, eventually it came around for, for clearances, for accuracy, okay. but it was in a different system, so. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. That, that relates to the yeah. storage of it. Um, you had con some concerns. Mr. Morrison articulated his concerns about um, if the transcript was leaked out. Um, and, and I think both you and Mr. Morrison agreed that it needed to be protected. I, uh, just a correction, I, I don't think it was Mr. Morrison. It was uh, Mr. Eisenberg, right? Uh, M Mr. Morrison testified at his deposition. Okay, we don't have that, that in front of us. If you can give us that, we'll take a look. Yeah, I think in this, but I could say for myself, I, I did, there were, okay. the concerns about leaks seemed valid and I, I wasn't particularly critical uh, I thought it, this was sensitive and I was not going to question okay. the attorney's uh, judgment on that. Right. And, and even on the code word server, you had access to it? Yes. Um, so, so at no point in time during the course of your official duties were you, were you denied uh, access to this information? Correct. Is that correct? Um, Ms. Williams, I, I want to um, turn to you for a moment. Um, and you testified that you believe the transcript is, is complete and accurate, other than the one um, issue you mentioned? Yes, yeah, substantively, substantively accurate, yes. Um, now, did you express any concerns to anyone in your office about what you heard on the call? My supervisor was in listening on the call as well. 
So because he had heard the same information, I did not feel a need to have a further conversation with him about it. And you never had any concerns with anyone else in the vice president's office? I did not discuss the call further with anyone okay. in the vice president's office. Okay. So you didn't flag it for the chief of staff or, or the vice president's counsel or anyone of that sort? Again, my, my immediate supervisor, Lieutenant General Kellogg, was in the room with me. Right. So. And after the call, did you and General Kellogg ever discuss the contents of the call? We did not. No. Okay. Now, in the run-up to the meeting in Warsaw, the, the vice president was meeting with President Zelensky September 1st in Warsaw. You were involved with the preparation of the vice president's briefing materials? I was. Um, and did you flag for the vice president this, uh, this you know, parts of the call that, that had concerned you? No, we did not include the call transcript in the trip briefing book. We don't normally include previous calls in trip briefing books. Okay. So just wondering if the, if the concerns were so significant, um, how come nobody on the vice president's staff at least alerted him to, to the issue that President Zelensky might be on edge about something that had been mentioned on the 725 call? Again, my, my supervisor had been in the call with me. Um, and I ensured that the vice president had access to the transcript uh, in, in the moment on that day. As we were preparing for the September meeting with President Zelensky, the more immediate issue on, at hand was two days prior, the news had broke, broken about the hold on the security assistance. So we were much more focused on the discussion that was likely to occur about the hold on security assistance for that meeting. And to your recollection, you were in the meeting with President Zelensky and Vice President Pence? I was and Burisma didn't come up, or the Bidens, or no. any of these investigations? No, okay. it did not. Um, Colonel Vimman, you, you testified that the president has well-standing, or long-standing concerns about corruption in Ukraine, correct? I don't, I don't recall, but th there are concerns. There are broad concerns about corruption, yes. But, but you would agree that if, we're, if the U.S. is giving, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to a foreign nation, that has a corruption problem. That, that's certainly something that the U.S. government officials and the president would want to be concerned about? Yes. Um, and if, if a foreign country um, has a, a problem with oligarchs taking money, taking U.S. taxpayer dollars, that's, that's something that the president ought to be concerned about in advance of uh, dispensing the aid? Yes. And I believe you did testify that corruption is endemic in Ukraine? Correct. Are you also aware of the president's um, skepticism of foreign aid generally? I am. And it's something that he's made part of his priorities to make sure that U.S. foreign aid is spent wisely? That is correct. And, and you're also aware the president has concerns about burden sharing among our allies? Yes. Uh, and with respect to Ukraine, he was... He was very interested and engaged in seeing if there was a possibility for our European allies to step up and contribute more? Yes, I think uh, that would be in the context of uh, military assistance. Um, in terms of burden sharing, the, the European Union uh, provides over $15 billion. Okay. Um, has but, provided since 2014. Okay, but you are aware of the President's concern of, of burden sharing, right? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, turning our attention specifically to the company of Burisma, um, Mikola Zochevsky, the, the co-founder of Burisma, um, it's one of Ukraine's uh, largest uh, natural gas producers, correct? That is my understanding, yes. Uh, and it's been subject to numerous investigations um, over the years. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not aware of, I guess I couldn't point to specific investigations, but there is a, uh, what I would call a, a pattern of questionable dealings and um, questions about corruption. Um, Zochevsky had uh, served as the Minister of Ecology during uh, President Yanukovych's tenure? I came to learn that that is correct, yes. And are you aware, and George Kent testified a little bit about this last week, that under the Obama administration, the U.S. government encouraged Ukraine to investigate whether Zochevsky used his government position to, to grant uh, himself or Burisma exploration licenses? Are you aware of that? I, I would defer to uh, George Kent. He's a fount of knowledge on Ukraine, much deeper knowledge than I, I have. Okay. And uh, if, he, if, he, if he attested to that, then uh, I'd take his word okay. for it. And, and he testified that the U.S., along with the United Kingdom, was engaged in, in trying to recoup about $23 million in taxpayer dollars uh, from Zochevsky and, and the Burisma entity? I understand he testified that, yes. Okay. Um, and 
Mr. Kent also testified that the investigation was moving along and then all of a sudden there was a, a bribe paid and the investigation went away. Did you, did you hear him mention that? I heard him mention that. Uh, okay. these, are, these are events that occurred before my time, so I, frankly, beyond what he said, I don't, I don't know much more. F fair enough. Um, right around the time the bribe was paid, the company sought, sought uh, to bolster their board. Are you aware that they, they tapped some luminaries for their corporate board? Uh, certainly, I learned that uh, at some point, yes. Uh, including the president of Poland, I believe? Yes. And um, Hunter Biden? Yes, I came to learn that as well. And are you aware of any uh, specific experience Hunter Biden has uh, in the Ukrainian uh, corporate governance world? I, I don't know uh, much about um, Mr. Hunter Biden. And we, we talked a little bit about, at your deposition, about whether um, Mr. Biden was qualified to serve on this board. Um, and, and, you know, I, I believe you acknowledged that apparently he was not, in fact, qualified. As far as I can tell, he didn't seem to be, but uh, like I said, I don't, I don't know his um, qualifications. Okay. Uh, and Ms. Williams, I want to turn our attention to the, uh, the inaugural trip. Okay. Um, at one point, the vice president and the vice president's office was focusing on attending that, correct? That's right. And it, it, it's somewhat complicated because, as I understand it, the White House doesn't want the president and the vice president to be out of the country at the same time. Yes, that's correct. Um, and, and during the time frame, the president was in Japan. Uh, I believe he was in Japan May 24th to 28th. And then he uh, returned to Europe for, for the D-Day ceremonies June 2nd to 7th. And I think, I think you, you told us that there was a window you provided of four days at the end of May, that if the vice president was going to attend the inauguration, um, it had to be the 29th, 30th, 31st, or 1st. Our embassy in Kyiv had been in discussions with the Ukrainian, with, um, with President Zelensky's team. And as we had learned, obviously, the, the Ukrainian parliament was not going to come back into session until mid-May. And so we wouldn't know formally what the date would be. Um, but we understood that the initial thinking was that the, they were looking at dates at the end of May. And so honing in on that time frame, we were aware of President Trump's planned travel on either end. And so that's why we advised the Ukrainians that if Vice President Pence were to be able to participate, the only really available days would be May 30th, May 31st, or June 1st. Okay, and before the Vice President travels to a foreign nation, you, you have to send the Secret Service, do advance work, book hotels, and it's, it's a relatively um, involved uh, preparation experience, right? That's correct. Um, and did, do you know if the Secret Service ever deployed booked hotels or anything of that sort? My understanding is that our advanced team was looking into those preparations, including hotel availability, um, and we were trying to determine when it would be appropriate to send out Secret Service and other advanced okay. personnel in order to lay groundwork for a trip. But because we weren't sure yet when the date would be, we hesitated to send those, those okay. officials out. Uh, but ultimately, the Secret Service, as I understand it, did not deploy. I don't believe they did, no. Okay. Um, and the, the President Zelensky's inauguration was May 20th, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, that's correct. And you had about four days' notice? In the end, the Ukrainian parliament decided on May 16th to set the date for May okay. 20th. That's correct. So you would acknowledge that that made it quite difficult for the vice president and the whole operation to mobilize and, and get over to Ukraine, correct? It would have been, but we had already stopped the trip planning by that point. And when did that happen? Stopping the trip planning? Yeah. On May 13th. Okay. And how did you hear about that? I was called by, uh, by a colleague in the, chief, my, the vice president's chief of staff's office and told to stop the trip planning. Okay. And as I understand it, it was the, the assistant to the chief of staff? That's correct. Okay. And so you didn't hear about it from General Kellogg or the chief of staff or... Correct. Or the president or the vice president. You, right. you heard about it from a, um, Mr. Short's assistant. That's right. Um, and did, did you have any, any knowledge of the reasoning for stopping the trip? I asked my colleague why we should stop trip planning and why the vice president would not be attending. And I was informed that the president had decided the vice president would not attend the inauguration. Okay. And, but do you know why the president decided? Um, no, she did not have that information. Okay. Um, and, and ultimately the vice president went to Canada for a USMCA event. That's right. During this, um, this window of time, correct? Correct. 
So it's entirely conceivable that the president decided that he wanted the vice president to go to Canada on behalf of USMCA instead of doing anything else, correct? I'm really not in a position to speculate what the motivations were behind the president's decision. Well, well you know, the vice president's done quite a bit of USMCA events, correct? Absolutely. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. And are you aware of whether the um, anyone at the State Department inquired with your office about the vice president's availability for the trip to Canada? For the trip, at what point? Um, early May, maybe May 8th. I, I was not involved in the trip planning for Canada. Mm -hmm. One of my colleagues who covers Western Hemisphere was, was in charge okay. of that, so I'm not aware of specific uh, okay. requests about okay. the vice president's availability. I was aware from my colleague who was planning that trip that we had competing trips potentially for the okay. same window, but I was told that the Ukraine trip would take priority. Okay, but ultimately you don't know. I don't know about the Canada trip? Or? You, you don't know the reason as to why the Vice President was sent to Canada for a USMCA event instead of going to the Ukraine? I would say I don't know the reason behind why the President directed the Vice President not to go to Ukraine. I can't speak to the motivations or the, uh, about the Canada trip. Okay. Um, Colonel Vindman, I'd like to turn a little bit to the July 10th meeting um, in Ambassador Bolton's office and the subsequent um, a post meeting in the wardroom. Um, who all was in the July 10th meeting, to the best of your recollection? Are we, are we talking about the wardroom or are we talking about the, um, the actual meeting with Ambassador Bolton? Uh, we'll start with the first meeting in the ambassador's office. So from the U.S. side, uh, we had um, Ambassador Bolton, Dr. Hill, uh, I believe uh, there was another uh, a special assistant to the president, uh, Wells Griffith was in there mm -hmm. uh, from our, and myself from the Ukrainians. Who from the Ukrainians? Oh, sorry. Yeah, for the Ukrainian side, we had um, Alexander Daniluk, um, Andrei Yermak, and I think Alexander Daniluk's um, advisor, um, Alexei Semeny. Okay. And you testified that you couldn't recall exactly why. Um, Ambassador Bolton stopped the meeting short, and you only learned it subsequently when talking to Dr. Fiona Hill? Yeah, I, I noted uh, that, you know, it ended up abruptly, but I didn't, frankly, uh, you know, I didn't exactly know why. And in, in, the, in the Bolton meeting, you don't remember Ambassador Sondland using the word Biden? He did not, okay. as far, to the best of my recollection. I don't think he did. And then the, the group decamped to take a photo, correct? Correct. Okay. So the general feeling of the group was a positive one at that time, even though it may have ended abruptly. I think uh, Ambassador Bolton uh, uh, was exceptionally qualified. He understood the, the, um, the strategic communications opportunity of having a photo, and uh, we prompted him to, to, to before we uh, completely adjourned, to see if he was willing to do a photo, and he, he did. Okay, so you went out to West Executive Ave or wherever in the White House and you took a photo. I think you said you took it? I, I certainly took a couple of them, yes. Okay. And in That's the photo is Secretary Perry, Ambassador Bolton, uh, Ambassador Volker. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah. Mr. Danny Luke and uh, Mr. Yarmark? Yes, and I apologize when I was running through the U.S. side. Uh, of course, Ambassador Bolton, uh, uh, Volker, and Sondland were there, and Secretary Perry was there. Okay. Um, now... You testified that before the July 10th meeting, you, you had developed concerns about the narrative, you know, involving Rudy Giuliani. Uh, is that correct? That is correct. And had you heard, like, a firsthand account from anyone on the inside, or had you just been following news accounts? Uh, so um, I certainly was following news accounts, and that's from the Ukrainian side, uh, Ukrainian press, and uh, U.S. press. Okay. Um, and, and then, then and my colleagues uh, in the interagency uh, also were concerned about this as this had started in the March time frame, kind of emanating uh, from the uh, John Solomon story all the way through. So we, there had been ongoing conversations, so several different sources. Okay. Um, and, and so when Ambassador Sondland mentioned the investigations, you, you sort of had a little bit of a clue of what the issue was? Oh, definitely. Okay, and then you, you, you took the photo, a very nice photo, and then you went to the wardroom? Correct. Um, and do you remember, I think you conceded to us that you had a hard time remembering exactly 
um, what was said in the wardroom. Again, it's four months ago. It's hard to be precise about whether um, Sondland, um, what specific words he used, whether he used Burisma 2016 investigations. Is yeah, so I, I believe it, it's uh, in the deposition. I, the three elements, um, Burisma, Biden's, and the 2016 elections were all mentioned. In the wardroom? Correct. Um, you know, I think, I, you know, I think we, we can maybe go back to this, but I, th I think on page 64 of your testimony, you, you told us that um, you don't remember him using a 2016 in the wardroom. I believe that, that I actually followed up and um, when you, because this question was asked multiple times, uh -huh. I, I said that all three elements were in there. So, okay, so picked out when we asked the question, it sort of refreshed your recollection? Yes, I guess that's okay. a term now. Um, there was um, some discussion of, you know, whether when Mr. Morrison took over the portfolio for Dr. Hill, um, whether you were uh, sidelined at all. Did, did you feel like you were? So I certainly um, was excluded or didn't participate in the, uh, the trip to Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus okay. at the end of uh, August. And I wasn't uh, initially, uh, before it changed from a, pr a POTUS trip to a vice president trip uh, to Warsaw, I wasn't participating in that one. So uh, I did, didn't miss that, no. Okay. Did you express any concerns to Mr. Morrison about why you weren't included on those trips? So M Mr. Morrison, uh, I was on leave, um, I was supposed to be on leave from the 3rd of August through about the, the 16th or so of August. Mm -hmm. And he called me and asked me to return. Uh, there, were, there was obviously a um, high priority travel to the region. He needed my assistance to help plan for it. Uh, and in asking me to return early from leave, uh, which I take infrequently, I assumed that I'd be gone on the trip. So when I was, after returning from leave early, when I was told I wasn't going, I inquired about it, correct? Okay, and what feedback did he give you? Uh, he initially told me that uh, the, the uh, aircraft that was acquired, the Mill Air, uh, was too small and there wasn't enough room. Did, um, had you ever had any discussions with Mr. Morrison about concerns that he or Dr. Hill had with the, your, your judgment? Did I ever have any conversations with uh, Mr. Morrison about it? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, did Mr. Morrison ever express concerns to you that he, he he thought maybe you weren't following the chain of command in all instances? He did not. Um, and um, did Dr. Hill or, or uh, Mr. Morrison ever um, ask you questions about whether uh, you were trying to access information outside of your lane? They did not. Uh, and um, another you know, aspect of the Ukraine portfolio that you were not a part of were some of the communications Mr. Morrison was having with Ambassador Taylor? Correct. And did you ever express concern that he was leaving you off those calls? Well, certainly it was concerning. Uh, he had just come on board. He didn't have the, um, you know, he, he wasn't um, steeped in all the items that we were working on, including the policy that we had developed over the preceding months. Um, and I thought I could contribute to that, to his, uh, to the performance of his duties. Okay. Um, when you were, you, you went to Ukraine for the uh, inauguration? Correct. The 20th. At any point during that trip, did Mr. Danny look offer you a position of defense minister with the Ukrainian government? He did. And how many times did he do that? I believe it was uh, three times. And do you have any reason why he, he asked you to do that? Uh, I don't know, but uh, every single time I dismissed it. Um, upon returning, I notified my chain of command and the, um, the um, appropriate uh, counterintelligence folks about this the offer. I mean, Ukraine's a country that's experienced a, a war uh, with Russia. Certainly their Minister of Defense is a pretty key position yeah. for the Ukrainians. President Zelensky, uh, Mr. Daniluk, to um, bestow that honor on you, at least asking you. I mean, that, that was a big honor, correct? I think it would be a great honor, and frankly, I'm aware of service members that have left service uh, to help uh, nurture the developing democracies in that part of the world, certainly in the Baltics, former officers, and if I recall correctly, it was an Air Force officer that became uh, uh, Minister of Defense. But 
I'm an American. I came here when I was a uh, toddler, and I immediately dismissed these offers, did not entertain them. Um, when, when, he, when he made this offer to you initially, did you leave the door open? Was there a reason that he had to come back and ask a, a second and third time, or was he just trying to convince you? Yeah, uh, counsel, you know what? It, it's, the whole notion is, is rather comical that um, I was being asked to consider whether I'd want to be the Minister of Defense. Uh, I did not leave the door open at all. Okay. But uh, it, it is pretty funny for a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army, which really is not that, not that senior, to be offered that um, illustrious a position. When, when he um, made this offer to you, uh, was he speaking in English or Ukrainian? Oh, uh, Mr. Daniel Luk is a uh, absolutely flawless English speaker who's speaking okay. in English. Okay. And, and, I, and just to be clear, there were two other staff officers, uh, Embassy Kiev staff officers that were in, sitting next to me when this offer was made. Okay. Yeah. And, and who were they? Uh, so one of them you may have met, uh, it was um, d uh, Mr. David Holmes, and the other one was, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, I guess I could, I'll, uh, it's another uh, Foreign Service officer, Keith Bean. Okay. Yeah, we met Mr. Holmes last Friday evening. I understand. <laughs> yeah. It's a delightful fellow. Um, and you said when you returned to the United States, you... Um, you papered it up given your, your, you know, with SCI clearance, whenever a foreign government makes a overture like that, you have to, you paper it up and you, you tell your chain of command? I did, but I also don't know if I fully entertained it as a legitimate offer. I was just making sure that uh, I did the right thing in terms of reporting, yes. Okay. And, and did any of your supervisors, Dr. Hill at the time, or, or, or Dr. Kupperman or Ambassador Bolton ever, ever follow up uh, with you about that? It's rather significant. Yeah. You know, the Ukrainians offered you the post of defense minister. Um, you know, did you tell anyone in your chain of command about it? After I uh, spoke to, and I believe it, uh, the deputy, um, our deputy senior director, John Arath, was there. Um, I spoke, once I mentioned it to both of them, I don't believe there was ever a follow-up discussion. Okay. Um, so it never came up with Dr. Kupperman or, or Dr. Hill? Following that conversation I had with Dr. Hill, I don't believe there was a subsequent conversation, and I don't recall uh, ever having a conversation with Dr. Kupperman about it. Okay, and did you brief uh, Dr. Or, sorry, Director Morrison when he came on board? No, I completely forgot about it. Okay, and subsequent to the May trip, did Mr. Danny Luke ever ask you uh, to reconsider? Were there any other offers? No. Uh, when he visited for the July 10th meeting in... Um, with Ambassador Bolton, did it come up again? It never came up again. Okay. Uh, and did you ever think that possibly if this information was, um, you know, got out, that it might, it might create the, at least the perception of a conflict that the Ukrainians thought so highly of you yeah. to offer you the defense ministry post, um, you know, on one hand, but on the other hand, you're responsible for Ukrainian policy at the National Security Council. So, frankly, it'd be, uh, uh, it's more important about what my, my, my American leadership, my American chain of command uh, thinks than any uh, of the, and th th this is, uh, these are honorable people. I'm not sure if he meant it as a joke or not, but it's much more important what my, uh, my civilian uh, White House National Security Council chain of command thinks more so than anybody else. And frankly, if they were concerned about me being able to continue my duties, uh, they would have they would have brought that to my attention. Dr. Hill uh, stayed on for several more months, and we could continue to work to advance U.S. policy. Okay. Um, during the, the the times relevant of the, of the committee's investigation, um, did you have any communications with Mr. Yarmok or Danny Look outside of the July 10th uh, meeting? I, I recall a courtesy note from Mr. Yarmok within days of his return to uh, July. Uh, in which he wanted to preserve an open channel communication, and I said, uh, you know, pl please feel free to contact me with any concerns. And, and were you following this, um, you know, there's sort of two tracks. Ambassador Taylor walked us through it uh, during his testimony last Wednesday. Uh, there was a, he called it a regular channel, and then he, he called it uh, an irregular, but not outlandish channel um, with Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Volker. Were you tracking the Sondland and Volker channel? During this time period? Yeah, so I'm trying to recall at which point I became aware of um, Ambassador. Certainly, I was aware of the fact that they were, um, 
they were working together, Sondland, Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Volker, and Secretary Perry were working together to advance U.S. policy interests that were in support of what had been agreed to. But I didn't really learn, like I said, until the July 10th, uh, actually, that's, there might, may have been a, a slightly earlier point. I, I recall a meeting in which uh, uh, Ambassador Bolton facilitated a meeting be, uh, between Ambassador Volker and Ambassador Bolton in, in the June time frame, and uh, there may have been some discussion about this external channel, but okay. I frankly didn't become aware of these particular uh, U.S. government officials being involved in this alternate track until uh, July 10th. Okay, and I think we, we had some discussion that, you know, Mr. Giuliani was promoting a negative narrative about the Ukraine, and, and certain officials were trying to help the president understand that with Zelensky, uh, it was a new day, and Ukraine's going to be different. Is that your understanding? Uh, that is correct. That is exactly what was being reported by the intelligence community, by the policy channels within the NSC, and the concerted voices of uh, the various people that have actually met with them, including foreign officials. And to the extent that you're aware of what Ambassador um, you know, Sondland's goals were here and Ambassador Volker's goals were here, I mean, you think they were just trying to do the best they could and, and try to advocate in the best interest of the United States? That, that, is, that is what I believe, and I, that is what I still believe, frankly. And so to the extent Mr. Giuliani may have had differing views, they were trying to help him understand that um, it was time to change those views? I think they were trying to um, um, bring him in, into the uh, tent and uh, have him uh, kind of support the direction that, was, that we had uh, settled on. And um, you, you never conferred with Mr. Giuliani? No. You never had any meetings, phone calls, or anything of that sort? I did not. Um, and did you have any? I only know him as uh, New York's uh, finest mayor. America's mayor. America's mayor. <laughs> um, and did you, did you have any discussions, uh, communications during this relevant time period with the president? I, I, I've never had any contact with the uh, president of the United okay. States. My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh